Welcome, everybody. This is How to English. Teach and learn with Gavin M. It's a podcast about teaching and learning English as a foreign language. All opinions stated are personal, and references will be given when necessary. How you get so high on the word language? I think I'm getting higher and higher each time I say that.、Em. Foreign language. Yeah. Language. But you know what we're going to focus on today, Em? I do indeed, Gav. One of my favourite topics. And what is that topic for the followers, Em? Episode eighteen. Reading. Reading is the topic. There are so many benefits to our teacher and learner followers, Em, that we are going to share in today's show. It's one of those things, isn't it, that people say, "Oh, I love reading." I'd like to get into that. I'd like to know more about reading. I could talk for hours about reading. Well, I'm not sure the followers have that much patience, but maybe you could tell us <laughs> what do you love about reading? I think it's escapism for me. It's that journey into a different world, into a place I've never been, from a different person's perspective, hearing a different voice, and just forgetting about my life and. I really love that feeling of being immersed in something and forgetting about everything else. And language, I just love the words, the way it's written, the written word on the page. I do. I am a sucker for written English, and that is a beautiful way to describe it. And I hope our followers feel exactly the same. And they are currently reading a book. Em, are you reading anything at the moment? Yes, I am, Gav. I am always reading a book, but I'm not one of those people that can read more than one book. I focus on one only, and then I finish it and start the next one. Some of my students tell me they're reading six books at the same time, which obviously doesn't mean all at the same time, but they've got them on the go. Oh, so a chapter at a time, and then switch to another book. Yeah. I can't do that. I'm not sure how I would do it. I'd start mixing up the characters and thinking, "Hey, what happened to that character? They're gone." Oh, yeah. Of course, that's not even in this book. <laughs> yeah, I would get mixed up. But I think a lot of the time they're reading different genres, so、mm. it's not just novels they're reading. It's maybe a bit of nonfiction as well. Em, I'd like to jump straight into our first activity that the followers may choose to do in their classes. I've got a list of questions here that I'm going to ask you about the book you're reading at the moment. That sounds really straightforward, Gav. But what if the student isn't reading a book in English or isn't reading a book? Well, it doesn't matter if the student isn't reading a book in English. They can still talk about the book they're reading. They can describe the plot, talk about the characters. Share their thoughts and feelings about the book. If they're not reading anything, I guess they need to think back to the last book they were reading, or they want to read a book that's out soon. Maybe. Great. What's your question? M. What is the genre of your current book? It's a non-fiction literary realist book. That sounds very interesting. So it's it's like reality. But it's something different from real life. Well, it's a made-up story about people you would maybe meet, but it's not based on anybody real, or it's not a true story. But it is based in the real world. Hmm. Is it written in first person? No, because first person is I. No, it's not written in first person. Is it written in second person or third person? M. Oh, okay. I thought you were going to ask individually.、Uh, no, it's not written in second person. Is that you? That would be you. That's like,、uh, do you remember those choose your own adventure books? Yes, but it was a long time ago. Please remind me. Oh, I loved them. I loved them so much. Let me give you an example. It starts with you are on a train to the Egyptian pyramids、Ooh. when your train suddenly comes to a halt. And there is no sound coming from the engine. Do you a look out of the train to see what's happening? B ask the other passengers if they know what's going on. C something else.、Mm, I definitely would do C something else, but I'm not sure exactly what yet. <laughs> I forget what it is. It's always a dramatic situation where you have to choose what to do. And then turn to page four hundred and seventy-two. 
That's right. They weren't that long in general. They were only about 100 pages long. But yeah, they'd say, turn to page 45 to find out what happens. And then you keep going and going and going. And most of the time you end up dying a horrible death. But there is an option where you live. Right. Okay. So you said your book's in third person. Yeah, coming back to that. Maybe I want to read those books again. But yeah, it's in third person, which I would say the majority of novels are. Would you agree with that? I think so, from experience. So it's written in the style of he, she, they, got up in the morning, went to work, and it's, as a narrator, it's as if there's another voice, another person narrating it for you. It sounds like a very interesting book because we all have those realist moments of getting up and going to work. Um, Where and And when? Are you being sarcastic, Gav? (laughs) Um, where and when was it set? Yeah, good question. It's set in Boston, in America, in recent history, I would say in the last 20 years. Mm. How do you know that? Uh, references to modern day things, places, people, things I recognise, the world as I know it. Mm. Can you tell me who is the protagonist? That would be like the main character. Well, that's what I like about the book, actually. There's a lot of protagonists. Doesn't really seem to be only one at the moment. There's at least four or five. Is it one of those stories where you follow lots of different people's lives? Yes. And then they all seem to merge somewhere later on in the book. Well, it isn't later on. It's actually a joint event at the beginning. And then they're all in different places as the book goes on. It's happening over the course of one day. Mm, Sounds absolutely fascinating. Can you tell me what is on the cover of the book? Oh, um, Is it a paper book? No, it's an e-book, so I don't actually remember looking at the cover. Let me have a look online. Uh, It's actually a pair of legs. Okay. Just from the knees down. Nice. Is it colourful? No, it's quite muted colours. Sombre. Yeah. All right. Why are you reading it and why did you choose it? Well, I love the author, so I kind of knew I was going to like it because I like all of her other books. Is it part of a series? No, no, it's not. It's a standalone novel. Mm. And finally, Em, what do you like about it? As I say, I like all the different perspectives. I really like seeing one event from different people's points of view and finding out more about the characters as it goes on. It's quite deep. There's a lot of history with the family. So, yeah, it's quite complicated, all their relationships. Can you tell us the title of the book and the name of the author, in case any of our followers have already guessed? (laughs) Yes, it's called Run, and it's by Anne Patchett. Mm, Okay, would you recommend this to our followers? I would definitely recommend it. It's very easy to read and enjoyable. You can put it down, pick it up again, and you can remember everything. Not too many characters, which is nice. And the language is quite good. It's sort of everyday English that you will experience in any situation. So it's useful for learners and fun for anyone else. It sounds like loads of fun. I might check it out myself. Actually, I wouldn't use the word fun, sorry. It's quite a serious topic, so I wouldn't say fun. Let me retract that word. Fun, it's just very interesting. So, Gav, you're reading a book at the moment. I am. And I don't want you to answer my questions. I want you to summarise it, if you can, as a paragraph. How would you tell me about this book? I would describe it as a novel by Toni Morrison, published in 1987, and the winner of the 1988 Pulitzer Prize for Fiction. The work examines the destructive legacy of slavery as it is chronicled in the life of a black woman named Seth from her pre-Civil War days as a slave in Kentucky to her time in Cincinnati, Ohio, in 1873. Although Seth lives there as a free woman, she is held prisoner by the memories of the trauma of her life as a slave. That is a very good summary, Gav, of the book Beloved, if I'm right. You are right. And thank you to Britannica.com for a little bit of help help (laughs) 
to create that summary. That was what my next question was. That was a good summary. So yeah, it was, wasn't it? Quite a heavy topic, but very, very well written. And it's also very readable, slightly abstract, jumps a bit around in time, but it's a really fabulous read. So as we said, you can use that activity in your class, whether the student is reading a book in English or any language, they can still summarise, they can give you lots of info, even describing the cover. So there's plenty of... Mileage. Mileage with that activity. Yeah, I like presenting it as a question interview style or as a summarisation in a paragraph and you can mix it up a bit in your lessons to get some of the class to give an interview and for others to write a paragraph, perhaps. That's nice. Maybe even a homework task. Very good. Have you got any more activities for us, Em? I like that one. Yes, Gav, I've got lots of activities today. So the next one is a matching exercise. I've got on these cards lots of different genres. If I give them to you, could you just read them out for us, please? I have got on these cards romance. Science fiction, mystery, fantasy, thriller, horror, LGBTQIA+, and non-fiction. Right. I'm going to tell you an author and a title of a book, and you need to match the genre to the author and the title. Okay? And you are really relying on my ability to know these things. <laughs> <laughs> yes, let's see how it goes, shall we? All right, and I hope the followers out there are going to help me. Please help me, followers. Okay, yeah, shout the answer if you know it. So the first one is Outliers by Malcolm Gladwell. Malcolm Gladwell. I know Malcolm Gladwell. The author of Tipping Point. You're right, yes. That is a very famous book. So I'm guessing this will also be a non-fiction book em i'm looking at my non-fiction card is that correct you are correct so this is more of a science based perhaps psychological um social sciences study of people mm -hmm. very interesting those are great books and that's a great genre too right i'm going to turn that card over yeah that one's done so the next one is evil under the sun by agatha christie Agatha Christie, famous for Miss Marple? Yep. Poirot? Yes. That must be a detective y kind of solve it mystery murder. I'm going for mystery. It is mystery. The queen of mystery, I would say. Very good. Thank you very much. I'm turning the card over. I've only got five cards left. Mm. So the next one is Never Let Me Go by Kazuo Ishiguro. Now, is this one of your favourite authors, M? Mm, I prefer Haruki Murakami, but I also like Kazuo Ishiguro too, yes. I think they might be of a similar genre. Mm. So fiction... Realist, did you mention before? But I haven't got realist here. So I'm going to use my powers of deduction. I'm going to go with science fiction. Yeah, yeah, you're right. It is science fiction. I think Kazuo Ishiguro is a bit more sci fi, perhaps. Murakami is more surrealism, mm -hmm. surrealist realism. Surrealist realism, not science fiction. Mm -hmm. This is a very tricky activity, Emma. I'm turning over another card. Okay, that is finished. They've made a few of Ishiguro's books into films as well, which are in the sci-fi genre. Ah, very clear. Next is Through the Looking Glass by Lewis Carroll. Now, I know Lewis Carroll very well. This is Alice in Wonderland. Mm. These are all the kiddies books that I loved growing up, and I know you loved them as well. Not just for kiddies, I would say, but yes, you are right. Definitely worth re-exploring as an adult. These must be fantasy books yes perfect fantasy with some nursery rhymes some childlike themes and dark mysterious weird stuff psychedelic weird abstract i mean it's almost a genre in its own right it kind of epitomizes the fantasy genre right that's another card done next one maybe there's a clue in the name here my sister the serial killer by Oyin Can Braithwaite. 
Hmm, that is not an author I know, and therefore that must be a genre that I'm not very familiar with. It must be the thriller slash horror slash slasher book. <laughs> thriller, horror, genre. My sister, the serial killer? Yeah, you're right. I don't know it either. I haven't read it, but it also says on the internet it's a dark comedy, so it could be a bit of dark humour in mm. there. Or Yinkan Braithwaite, Nigerian-British novelist and writer. She has won several awards and is a long-listed winner of the Booker Prize and Dublin Literary Award. If this is your genre, check out that book. Sounds great. So that just leaves one more, Gav, and that is The Colour Purple by Alice Walker. I know The Colour Purple. It was also made into a movie. That is a coming-of-age LGBTQ plus book, which is sometimes considered a subgenre of contemporary fiction, but may also have a mix of romance, fantasy and other genres. But it's definitely worth checking out if you're not familiar with the LGBTQIA genre. And if you're interested in genres and subgenres and you'd like to hear more, go back to episode 23 of season three, where we talked about books. What was that episode called, Gav? It was titled Book Club. Check it out. Em, I'd like to do an activity with you now. Ready. I visited Nikki Van Rye's First Lines Beginnings of Novels at bookwrite.com. Thank you to you. I'll put a link in the show notes. What I've got, M, is the first line or the beginning of a book. Uh huh. And all I want you to do is to tell me what does it evoke in you. Really? Okay. So you can tell me what do you think maybe the book's about? Where do you think the plot is going to go? What do you think this line is describing to us? Nice. I like that. To begin with, let me read the first line from the book I'm currently reading. It begins. 124 was spiteful, full of a baby's venom. The women in the house knew it, and so did the children. 124, that's the first word. So it makes me feel a bit sad, I suppose, that, and it's very negative, and it makes me want to know why, why this person has so much hate and spite in them. Mm, so you think it's a person? I don't know. It's got me intrigued. Yeah, it's got my interest, definitely. I want to know more because I don't understand the sentence. Because spiteful does sound like it's by a person. 124 was spiteful. Exactly. It's a characteristic of a person. Um, this is the first line, the first couple of lines, from Toni Morrison's Beloved. Toni Morrison was an American novelist, the critically acclaimed Song of Solomon. Her novel, published in 1977, brought her national attention and won the National Book Critics Circle Award. In 1988, Morrison won the Pulitzer Prize for Beloved, which is the lines we just heard. 124 refers to the address where the ghost of a murdered child returns to haunt her mother. Mm. That is dark. Mm. But as you said, really intriguing and fascinating. Emma, I'm going to move on to the next book and the next first line. I write this sitting in the kitchen sink. In the kitchen sink. In the kitchen sink. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> that makes me think it's an animal, perhaps, or from a very small person's perspective. So again, I'm interested because I have no idea why this person or thing would be in the kitchen sink and writing in the kitchen sink. So they've gone there intentionally to write about something. I have so many questions. I was immediately picturing a hedgehog <laughs> when you said something. But then maybe there are rats and mice running around the kitchen floor and instead I'm just sitting in the sink. I have no idea. It really could be anything. It could be a child sitting in the sink, just wedged right in there. It could be a big sink. I have no idea. And I love that they took the opportunity to write rather than call the exterminators or whatever they needed. Mm. This is from I Capture the Castle by Dodie Smith, novelist and playwright. 
Dorothy Gladys Dodie Smith was an English novelist and playwright. She is best known for writing I Capture the Castle and the children's novel The Hundred and One Dalmatians. Ah. Other works include Dear Octopus and The Starlight Barking. Nice. They're all really nice titles and I love that first line. Why were they sitting in the sink? Um, Our next beginning of a book is... In a hole in the ground, there lived a hobbit. Not a nasty, dirty, wet hole filled with the ends of worms and an oozy smell. Nor yet a dry, bare, sandy hole with nothing in it to sit down on or to eat. It was a hobbit hole, and that means comfort. Hmm, that's nice. So that's Tolkien, isn't it? I know that. And it makes me want to know more about this world. Because I think when I read that book, I didn't know what a hobbit was. I didn't know what a hobbit hole looked like. And it's so descriptive, isn't it? I just love the language, as I said before. It's so immersive and just creates a picture in your head so well. So what is a hobbit? It's a character from Lord of the Rings, kind of. Well, a hobbit is a hobbit. I don't know. It's. Uh... <laughs> I think you'd have to read the book, Gav, to I find think so. out. It sounds like they live in comfort. I know that much. And they like breakfasts. Plural <laughs> breakfasts. So this line was, as you said, M, The Hobbit by J.R.R. Tolkien. John Ronald Rill Tolkien. Oh, who knew? Born 3rd of January 1892, Tolkien was an English writer and philologist. Philologist. That's a nice word. What's a philologist do? A philologist studies the structure, historical development and relationships of language or languages. M. That explains a lot. Love the language. It is quite hard for learners, I will say, to try and read these books by Tolkien. Maybe start with the movies. Mm. Or go for The Hobbit because it's shorter. But I have had students say they tried Tolkien because he's one of the greats and gave up because it is difficult. Oh, that's a pity. But I've also had students say they've read all books by Tolkien and they've read all three Lord of the Rings books, which just amazes me. So it is possible. That is incredible. So Tolkien was the author of the high fantasy works The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings, both of which were made into box office hit movies. Very good they are too. Our next line is... How should a person be? For years and years I asked it of everyone I met. I was always watching to see what they were going to do in any situation so I could do it too. I was always listening to their answers so if I liked them, I could make them my answers too. I noticed the way people dressed, the way they treated their lovers in everyone. There was something to envy. You can admire anyone for being themselves. Wow. That's another one in first person. There's us saying it's mostly third person, but we've already had two in first person. The I write this sitting in the sink one, and this is another one that starts with I. I asked myself, I asked these questions. Yeah, it makes me really identify with this person. Maybe I felt this way growing up a little bit. I didn't know how to act, and I identify with the person writing it. Learning from other people's behaviour could help you shape your own character. Exactly. This is fascinating. This is from the book How Should a Person Be? by Sheila Hetty. She was born on the 25th of December 1976 in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. Her parents are Hungarian Jewish immigrants. Her father wanted to name her after Woody Allen, but her mother was vociferously opposed. (laughs) Right. So she was born on Christmas Day. That's wonderful, isn't it? Nice. I haven't heard of her, so I'd like to read some more. I'm definitely inspired by your first line to continue reading this book. It was really engaging. How should a person be? That is such a good line. What a great opener. I think I'm putting this one on my Christmas list. It's kind of appropriate. (laughs) Wonderful. Okay, our last one, Em, is history has failed us, but no matter... Oh. That's short. Wow. That's big. That's a big statement followed by a very strange kind of brushing off of that statement. So Mm. what do you mean by brushing off? Disregarding it, dismissing it. So hey ho, it happens. And why would somebody write that? I mean, that tells me a lot just in the first line. Who is us? 
Is it us people, our friends, our family, our community, mm. our nation? Yeah, I think the world when I read that. But yeah, it could be a smaller group perhaps. So maybe a deeper topic they're going into or maybe there's some resentment there, but maybe not. I don't know. But no matter. It sounds so carefree. Mm, I think you have to just get on with life, even if some people fail you. Gav, who's that by? What's the book? It's from Pachinko by Min Jin Lee. Min Jin Lee is a Korean-American author and journalist based in Harlem, New York City. Her work frequently deals with Korean and Korean-American topics. She is the author of the novels Free Food for Millionaires and Pachiko. Here's a nice quote from Kendra Winchester. Who's that? Kendra Winchester is a contributing editor for Book Riot, where she writes about audiobooks and disability literature. She's quoted saying, I was smitten from this first line. In seven words, Lee sets up Pachinko's entire narrative, which features a group of people all too often forgotten from history, but they are still resilient. They are survivors. Mm. Nice quote. Definitely. And I've got a lot of reading to do, Gav, on my list now. Thank you for that. You're very welcome. Thank you again to... Nikki Van Rij for her first lines slash beginnings of novels. And that was from bookwrite.com. Link in the show notes. Great activity. And I love how it's not the normal kind of activities. And I hate to say that. We've done a few, haven't we, Gav, over the years, reading books. But this is a really good one. And it's a really nice way to get your students talking and getting their imaginations going. Um, I didn't realise just how creative you were. <laughs> no, I'm not sure if I did justice to these amazing books, but I like the idea of this activity. You can use it with any kind of book. You could get students to Google their own books to find the favourite line from the book they're reading or a book they know really well. And it's really good to learn about genres that you may not read or authors you may not have heard of. It's a sharing activity. It's a language activity. It's expressing yourself. It's it's a definite yes from me. Good. And I hope the followers enjoyed it as much as I did and you did. Um, I think that everyone now realises that we love books. We love reading. We love literature. We love all of the stories, the plot twists, everything that goes into a story. Do you know somebody else who likes books? librarians and today's guest gav today we are featuring we are bettering we are bettering they are an online language school on their instagram you can learn english with taylor swift explore the topic of clothes with barbie and grammar vocabulary and everyday expressions what's more on their website you can find individual or group classes for general travel or business english so check them out and get to know Fran, Yotti, and Scarf the Dog. And their website is betteringlang, that's L-A-N-G, dot com. And their Instagram is we are bettering one word. Now here's Josefina to talk about why she loves reading. And remember, followers, if you'd like to take part in a future episode, get in touch with us at our coffee page or on our socials at How to English Pod. Links in show notes. Hello, Gavin M. And hello to all your listeners as well. My name is Josefina and I am an online English teacher from Necochea, a small city in Argentina. And I am here to talk about my favorite activity, reading, and about how it can help improve your English. When asked, my initial suggestion to my students is to read more widely and more often. A critical component, I believe, of developing English speaking and writing abilities. And indeed, a central part of learning any foreign language. Of course, it can be extremely challenging to simply pick up an English novel and read it. But then this is how you, as a non-native English speaker, will learn a more extensive vocabulary and be able to express yourself more confidently. After all, reading opens up so many doors for communication and contact. There is a whole world of literature available in English, as almost all of the most translated books in the world have English versions. 
Maybe, if you're a beginner, you could consider reading picture books and graphic novels. Some examples are Good Night Stories for Rebel Girls by Elena Fabili and Francesca Cavallo and Smile by Reina Telgemeier. If you're an intermediate English student, you could focus on short stories and relatively short novels that are about subjects that interest you. The Little Prince by Antoine de Saint-Exupéry, Wonder by R.J. Palacio, and The Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime by Mark Haddon immediately come to mind. And finally, if you're at an advanced level, then in this case my suggestion would be some longer books, such as My Salinger Year by Joanna Rakoff or Into the Wild by John Krakauer. And maybe even try your hand at the classics of English literature, like Little Women by Louisa May Alcott and one of my personal favorites, or A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens. If you have any questions or want to share your experience reading these books or any other you chose to improve your level, you can find me online at We Are Bettering on all social media platforms. Thanks, everybody, and thanks, Gavin M., for allowing this participation in your lovely podcast. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Josefina. Some great recommendations there. And I'll put the titles to each of those books in the show notes, Em. It's great that Josefina broke it down into levels so it was easy to recognise which books would be the right ones for your students or for you. Mm -hmm. So you can advance using Josefina's guide. As Josefina mentioned, Picture books and graphic novels are a great way to get started, especially if you're not that keen on reading even in your own language. Definitely. Read more widely and often. Yeah, it can be challenging, but I think it is really rewarding and it's important to read things you enjoy. And there's no pressure, is there, if you're reading a book? There's nobody telling you to go faster or to understand everything. You can go at your own pace, which is what I love about books. That's it. We all read at different speeds. But how can reading help with your speaking as well as your reading and writing skills? Well, as Josefina said, I think it broadens your vocabulary. So you may recognise words in speech because you've read them somewhere. It will help you with your grammar because you'll see the structures, you'll see the construction of sentences. I guess it's just going to happen. If you read more, you use that language when you're speaking. Mm, definitely. I guess this just leaves us enough time to do Learn a, Learn a word. word. Today's Learn a Word, Gav, is many words. <laughs> <laughs> words about books. Books. Yeah. I've written a list of words and I want to elicit them from you, if possible. Ooh, so we're not diving inside the book. We're actually looking at the book itself. Yes, the physicality of it. That is another way to look at books. Cool. So if we start with words, if you put words together, what do you get? Sentences. If you put sentences together, what do you get? A paragraph. If you put paragraphs together, what do you get? Pages? No. Now you've got... Chapters! Yeah! Oh! You get chapters. Most books have chapters. Not all books, but most books. Some chapters are numbered, some have names, but most books, not all, have chapters. So, yeah, you've already said one of the words. The words, the paragraphs, the chapters are all written down on... Pages. So what's the verb when you want to... Lick your finger and turn the page. You wouldn't do that with an e-book, but yes, turn the page, exactly. Oh, and you could describe the book as a page turner. You could, very nice. Meaning that you find it difficult to put it down. Yeah, you just want to keep reading it. Very good. What some books have at the beginning is a list of things that will be coming up in the book. Is that the contents? It is the contents. It's and not the index, because I think well, that's at the back. That was You're going ahead of me now. <laughs> you're going ahead of me. So, yeah, the back would be, say again? The contents. No, that's the front. The index. The index is at the back. Right, Gav, do you know the phrase, never judge a book by... It's footnotes. No. <laughs> Never judge a book by its... Cover. But you do, don't you? I always do. I pick it up and I think, is this the book that I want to read because the cover is interesting, colourful, yeah. is diverse? I don't know. I'm looking for something interesting, Em. But when we say the idiom, never judge a book by its cover, what are we really saying? Get to know them first. <laughs> Get to know what? The book? 
Yeah, but I mean the idiom. Yes. Never judge a book by its cover, Gav, doesn't necessarily relate to books. It could be about people as well. Yeah, so just don't judge it before you get to know it. Exactly. Or them. Yeah, back to books then. Real books, not e-books. You're looking at the name of the book. If it's on a shelf and you can't see the front cover... I look at the spine. Like your spine. You've got the same thing in your back, haven't you? Yeah, it's keeping me upright. That's right, so it's on a book as well. Back to the page. Sometimes there's extra information at the bottom of the page. What's that called? They are called the footnotes, M. They are. And I do read them, although they can be extensive in non-fiction books sometimes, especially historical ones. That is true. They can break up the flow a little bit, which is why they're footnotes, I suppose. They're there if you want extra information. Are you going to mention dog-eared? <laughs> no, I haven't got that one, but that's nice. What's that mean? That's where you fold over the corner of the page to remember to go back to that page later when you want to read or maybe it suggests that the book's been read so many times that the pages are in fact damaged that's true some people use the dog ear method instead of a bookmark which we also have online now but they come from books i suppose so you mark your page the Mm. one where you left off so you can start again that's right like a piece of card or paper or something with a little tassel hanging off the top nice bit of tassel yes uh okay so i think that's all my words about books um before we finish we need to just share a couple more fabulous book and reading idioms this time from charlotte at charlotte teaches english go ahead charlotte book expressions in english now A closed book is someone or something that we do not know very much about, whereas an open book is somebody that we can read or understand very easily. I hope you found this useful and like, share and follow me, Charlotte Teaches English for more English lessons. Thank you very much. Go and check out Charlotte's Instagram at Charlotte teaches English and you'll get loads more great expressions. Thanks so much, Charlotte. Some really good idioms there. Gav, do you know any other book idioms? I could say that we did the pod by the book, meaning to do it according to the rules. We don't make rules, though, do we, really? But I do think we're on the same page, Gav. Meaning? We're in agreement and we both have the same idea. Well, I certainly wouldn't like to be in your bad books. (laughs) No. Well, you're not in my bad books at the moment, Gav. If I read between the lines, Em, maybe that was a warning. No, no, Gav. Stop reading into things. Just take me at face value. I'm not being dishonest. Well, I certainly can't read your mind. (laughs) Em, let's just turn a page on this and I'll see you next time. Yes, we should probably wrap this up before I throw the book at you. (laughs) 